I think it's a remarkable fact, speaking psychologically and historically, that there's a book at the basis of our culture, and, and that's how we define the culture, as based on the book, and that it's a collection of books, and that the collection was aggregated so that, it, that a plot emerges from it. And Christians take that idea one step further in some sense, because they assume that not only is the Old Testament a library of books that has a plot, but that implicit in that book is the New Testament. It's somehow their a priori before the events actually unfold. And that's an extremely bizarre and interesting idea, and it's very difficult to know what to make of it. Now, the Bible, in its various forms, isn't exactly a book, it's a library of books, right? It's a collection of books, but it's an interesting collection of books, to say the least, because despite the fact that it's a library, so a collection of books, it also has a narrative theme that runs through it, right? It has a beginning and a middle and an end, and it has a plot, strangely enough, and I say strangely because how did it get plotted exactly? You know, I mean, obviously, believers believe that it's the Word of God, and fair enough, you know, but that's not a very detailed explanation. It's a religious interpretation, but it's shallow in some sense. It lacks detail. It still doesn't explain in any fundamentally compelling sense how the narrative got organized across time. And you say, well, it's the Spirit of God working through the multitude of people who aggregated the Bible and transmitted it, and fair enough. It's not, still not a deep enough level of understanding to make me feel that when I, for what that's worth, when I encounter that explanation, that it's been thoroughly explained. And, you know, that's not a criticism precisely. Anything that's complex is susceptible to ever increasingly deep explanations. You know, in some sense, if something's deep, you never get to the bottom of it, and all explanations are insufficient. But. I think it's a remarkable fact, speaking psychologically and historically, that there's a book at the basis of our culture, and, and that's how we define the culture, as based on the book, and that it's a collection of books, and that the collection was aggregated so that, it, that a plot emerges from it. And Christians take that idea one step further in some sense, because they assume that not only is the Old Testament a library of books that has a plot, but that implicit in that book is the New Testament. It's somehow their a priori before the events actually unfold. And that's an extremely bizarre and interesting idea, and it's very difficult to know what to make of it. Um, so I was thinking these things when I was going through the museum. And I was thinking about the idea of the canon, and about the idea of fiction and truth, and about the idea of literary depth, all of those things, trying to make sense out of them, partly because, as I said, we now seem to have uh, reached an impasse in our culture about what can be validly considered canonical. And part of the way this came about, I have to take a detour through the history of ideas, is that um, it was discovered in a variety of different disciplines after the Second World War, really, I would say, starting in the, in the 60s, that the problem of perception was a much more intractable problem than anybody had heretofore s suspected. And so that emerged partly in the field of artificial intelligence when the first artificial intelligence researchers who were interested in robotics tried to make machines that could operate in the real world like animals could, or like people could, to, to build robots. The idea, to begin with, was that the difficult part would be programming the robot to operate in the environment. The easy part would be getting the robot to perceive the environment, because after all, there it is. You just have to look, and everything's self-evident. Um, and it turned out that that wasn't the case at all. And this was reflective of a philosophical problem that had been recognized by David Hume sometime earlier, which is the problem of the relationship between what is and what ought to be. And David Hume believed that there was an unbridgeable gap between the factual world and the ethical world, in some sense, that you never had enough facts at your disposal to compute your trajectory into the future with any degree of certainty. And I think that, that that's been proven true beyond a shadow of a doubt as a consequence of recent investigations 
which have demonstrated not least that, well, one of the problems is that, and this is associated with the problem of perception, is that there's an infinite number of facts. And so how do you guide, how do you guide your actions in light of the facts when there are endless facts about absolutely everything, absolutely everywhere all the time? Which facts do you attend to to guide yourself forward? Which facts do you prioritize? And which do you ignore? Because obviously you have to ignore most of them because there's a near infinite number of facts and you're not going to pay attention to all of them because you can't. And so how do you decide what not to pay attention to? And the answer is, you don't know. And that's the general answer is, which we don't know. And it's exactly the same as the problem of perception because when you look out the world, look out at the world, or hear the world for that matter, or taste the world, any of those things, any, any sensory interaction with the world is there's way more things to look at than you can possibly look at and yet you do look at things and you see and then the question arises how do we do that and the answer is we don't know and it's such an intractable problem that we haven't been able to build machines that can do it that's why we don't have general purpose robots and you know I, I think the closest thing we've got to them probably so far are Elon Musk's self-driving cars, but you still don't really see those everywhere, right? They crack that problem 80%, maybe something like that, but that last 20% is not gonna be so easy. And it's partly because, for example, you know, imagine that there's a navigation problem, that, that having a car propagate itself down the highway is a navigation problem. And, and you might think that's a technical problem, you need to know where the road is, the, the edges of the road and so forth, which isn't so easy because roads don't actually have defined edges, but that's one of many problems. And so we've had to put up a whole satellite system to map the roads in detail and to feed that information into the cars and the cars can compare where they are on the road to the satellite image. And they have to have very detailed perceptual knowledge of the world to operate, but then there's additional problems that have to do with navigation that aren't so obvious, for example, Let's say you're driving down the road and there's a mother and a child um, in a pram on one side of the road and there's like three old women on the other side of the road and you have to run over one set of them. And that actually turns out to be in some real sense a navigation problem, obviously, but just as obviously it's an ethical problem. And how do you solve that? And the answer again is, well, you don't know. If you were in that situation, I don't know what you would decide or how you decide it, but I do know that you don't know how you would decide it. And actually our navigation problems are always ethical problems. That's a, at least that's the proposition that I wanna offer you tonight is that our navigation problems are always ethical problems.